My name is Nira Oreck. It's a real pleasure to be on this uh, Zoom event with you. Um, I'm a board member with Vision Vancouver, um, and I'm here to welcome you to today's discussion about how to engage at City Hall. Um, as we get started, um, I'd just like to, of course, acknowledge that we're here gathered in a virtual space, but I myself and I assume many of you are here on the unceded ancestral territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, you should know this event was inspired by um, a series from that came out of Toronto um, about engaging at City Hall. Um, some of you probably know that many people try to engage uh, with our, you know, at City Hall and um, school board and park board and um, end up in very, very long meetings and, um, and struggles with public engagement. And I think with um, the city's best effort, there's a challenge in terms of reaching and engaging um, people who want to speak to and about issues impacting them in, in their city. So um, we're hosting this event because um, we know that if you aren't asked to speak or asked to engage, you may not. And if you don't know how to, um, or are uncomfortable or uncertain about how to, um, sometimes getting a little bit of a tour around the space can help do that. Um, so before we, we've got an amazing group of panelists and I will um, introduce all of you to them. Um, first of all, I just actually want to tell you that um, you're in really good company. Almost 200 of you um, RSVP to be at this event tonight, which really says something um, about the hunger to engage in our city at this moment. Um, I'm curious, you should get a poll um, that comes up in the chat. Um, and um, hopefully you'll see it. And the, and the question is, um, how many of our participants have been to a meeting at City Hall, either online or in person? If you have a moment to um, respond, that would be great. Okay. Um, I will, we'll come back to that. Um, I've lost my uh, sight of the poll, but I was last I saw it for a moment. It was a, um, a an overwhelming result of people that that were engaging. So um, that's great. And if we get the actual numbers, I'll report back. Um, so I'm gonna do some introductions. Oh, there we go. 68% of you um, have been to a meeting at City Hall, and 32% of you haven't. So we can learn together from each other. Um, tonight and um, and hopefully hear some of your stories and also of course some of your questions. Um, we're very lucky to have Heather Deal joining us tonight to provide a virtual walkthrough of City Hall. Um, she, you couldn't ask for a better person. Heather served as a Vision Vancouver City Councilor from 2005 to 2018 and before that she was elected and served as a Vancouver Park Board Park Board Commissioner, many of you probably know Heather, um, and it's a pleasure, Heather, to have you here. Following our virtual walkthrough, um, we'll welcome some experienced activists and leaders who will share their hot tips of, and experiences of making change at City Hall. Um, for those of you meeting our panelists for the first time tonight, let me tell you a little bit about them. Erin Leung served as chair of the City of Vancouver Children, Youth and Families Advisory Committee between 2016 and 2018. The committee advises Vancouver City Council, School Board and Park Board on issues related to children and families. In 2018, Erin ran for a seat on Vancouver School Board with Vision Vancouver and, and is a previous recipient of the city's Rena City Leadership Award. We won't get into his day job, but he's a, a great person for you to hear from tonight. Charles Gauthier, from 1992 to mid 2021, Charles served as the president and CEO of the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. Throughout this time, Charles guided the Downtown the BIA to a legacy of accomplishments and prestigious awards. Born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, he has a master's in city planning uh, from the University of Manitoba. And before arriving here in Vancouver, 
Charles worked with a number of non-governmental um, organizations in Manitoba and BC. Charles recently stepped down and is enjoying retirement, so it's a real pleasure to have him here tonight. He's um, keeping busy with lifelong and new hobbies and uh, hopes to travel abroad. Before you do, Charles, we're thrilled to have you here. <coughs> Theo Lamb. Theo is a passionate community organizer serving as the executive director of Quest Outreach Society, where she advocates for food security on behalf of lower mainland communities. She is also a co-founder of Feeding Growth, a program run in partnership by Van City and, and UBC Farms, committed to supporting progressive food entrepreneurs interested in scaling their businesses. Theo learned the ins and outs of speaking to, to city council when she was the executive director of the Strathcona Business Improvement Association, often with her young son by her side. Um, you will meet all of them a little bit later, but on behalf of the Board of Vision Vancouver, I want to thank Aaron and Theo and Charles, and of course, Heather for making time to join us tonight. Um, so let me turn things over to our virtual guide, Heather. Thank you, Mira. I'm not feeling that virtual, but um, uh, it's real in my kitchen here tonight. Thanks everyone for being here and thank you to the board and the organizers and volunteers and staff at Vision for putting this together. I love all these panelists. I know them well. We're going to have a great time talking tonight and I'd really like us to have a good conversation. I know that a lot of you here have been to City Hall. I know that some of you have spent almost as many hours in, the, in those uh, rooms as I have, uh, but I want to just do a quick um, overview of the basics of City Hall for those who have not made it in yet. And we know there are some of you out there and we'd love to see you all show up someday. So first of all, Vancouver City Council is made up of the mayor and 10 councillors. And as you can see here, oh, there I am down there next to Raymond, Andrea. Um, it is a weak mayor system. So the mayor is essentially another councillor. He gets to sit in the big chair, but uh, he has one vote and he does not have the, the powers of veto. That's not always the same in other places in the world or even in North America. Um, but when I was at City Hall, I had a really huge advantage. With Vision Vancouver, I came in as a member of a team, and that made a real difference. What you're seeing there today is people who are not necessarily on a large group together, a team that can move things forward as, as a, a, a group working together. And that's kind of led to some of the really long meetings and agendas that you've seen in the last few years at City Hall. And it makes things easier, or more, sorry, more difficult to move forward. Beyond council, there's staff. Uh, here's the, the org chart, the, the highest level of org chart. So the city manager is a really key person and that person has a lot of, a lot of interaction with the elected, the elected uh, folks there. And there's department heads that we also spend quite a bit of time with. There's also uh, other boards. We have the park board, we have the school board, we have an appointed library board, and we have a police board. So the staff are really super important role for us because you know we love to talk about what we want to do and we love to talk about what needs to be done we love to to vote for things but we don't do the work the staff do the work so we have to work really well with them and one of the things i watch really closely when i'm watching council is how they interact with staff and how respectful that relationship is because honestly we can talk till we're blue in the face and if the staff aren't there working with us and making those things happen it's just talk so it's a really delicate balancing act for the staff and the staff can't do things on direction from a single counselor. They have to do things on direction from the majority of council. That's then the council position that they then move forward with. So moving on to the next slide, um, what are counselors responsible for and how do decisions get made? So this is something that I'm very, very proud of with Vision's history. With our history, with each of our elections, we would put forward a platform. You, you saw them if you were involved or engaged. The smallest one I think had 37 bullet points and the biggest one I think had 82 bullet points of things that we wanted to get done. They were broken up by category, whether it was mental health and addictions, uh, complete neighborhoods, arts and culture, active transportation. And we would list out the things we wanted to do under each of those things. And the day that we got elected, we would, well, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours later, we would go into a room with whiteboards and stickies and, and, and post-it notes and lots of pens and we would turn that platform into our work plan for the next three or now four years. So, <laughs> sat in the school board. Um, sorry, I sat in the chat room. I get distracted by chat, my bad. So our, our platform became our work plan. And what happened as a result of that is that the staff knew where we were going. 
the public knew what they had voted for and what we were going to be working on and what our priorities are. And they knew that as the governing body, as the majority of council, we were gonna move forward quarter by quarter, year by year through the things that we had said we were going to do. And that's something that gives people, whether they like what you're doing or not, it gives them the comfort of, of certainty. There's always uncertainty that comes along, things that you don't expect. But when someone says to you, I don't like a thing that you did, why didn't you ask me? I will then point them to not only how many times we did ask them, but the fact that we ran on doing that and were elected to do certain things. Bike lanes come to mind, for instance. When you're opposing, you don't feel the responsibility of governing. And governing is much more difficult than opposing. Governing means you're responsible for a one point, I think it's $7 billion a year operating budget now, plus the capital budget. When you're governing, you have to make hard decisions that affect everybody, whether they're on your team or not. When you're opposing, it's really easy because you just have to find a flaw. And there's almost always a flaw somewhere that you can find and point out and point to that and say, this is wrong. You don't have to pose solutions. So as we move on to what powers does council have? This is something that's widely not understood or misunderstood. We mostly have land use and zoning powers. We, we decide, you know, what goes where, and that's a very active conversation right now. Tomorrow at city council, it'll be a very active conversation. We collect property taxes, no other kinds of tax, property tax. So people say, why don't you tax this or that thing that we think should be more difficult to buy? It's like, that's not our job. We don't have that authority. We also set fees for parking and for development. We, we all like to talk about parking fees, another hot topic these days. And then we also give grants out to community services and arts and culture. And that's a very active program. I don't think people realize how much money is actually passed back to organizations around the city uh, every single year through council. We also pass the exciting things like bylaws and regulations, uh, transportation plans, uh, business licenses. Business license hearings are very exciting sometimes. Building code and noise bylaws. And here's a fun fact. If you're a deputy mayor, you actually only have one authority. And that is you can tell someone they can make noise outside of the normal noise hours. The only actual legal authority of the deputy mayor. So um, you can also advocate for issues that are beyond the actual powers of council. So you can go and you can advocate to other orders of government for things like a national housing policy or mental health and addictions uh, uh, supports, the Broadway subway, for instance, and continuing to advocate to get it all the way out to UBC. And we can also work through our provincial and federal organizations of the municipalities, the, U the um, UBC, UBCM, which is the Union of BC Municipalities, and FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So the meetings that you can attend, you can attend council meetings, you can attend standing uh, committee meetings, and you can go to public hearings. At council meetings, the council makes decisions, uh, people pass motions, the public can't speak at council, but if you want to speak to an item, you can request to. And if council says, yeah, we're willing to hear from you, you'll get bumped to a committee meeting. Motions are different than reports. Reports are generated by staff and they, is they direct issues around policies and they, they move you forward in terms of giving direction to the things you said you wanted to do, fleshing those out. But when you're actually doing motions, those are direction from council to staff and they're often contentious. They can be political and they can make meetings very long if there are a lot of motions. And they've got quite a few motions on the agenda this week. The standing committees are where you hear from the staff in more detail. You hear from the public on whether they like or don't like a certain issue that you're going to vote on. Uh, and then you vote on those issues. And then you actually have to then punt that back to council to, to finalize those votes because decisions are made at council. The debate uh, with the public input is done at committee. And then public hearings are a quasi-judicial setting where you can vote on two things. One is her heritage designation and the other one is rezoning. So at a council meeting, you might vote to send something to a public hearing and then you have the debate at the public hearing and they can be quite long. They have 10 items on this week's public hearing, which is really crazy long, but it looks like most of them don't have a lot of pieces of, of input that have been sent in. So they might be quite quick. There, uh, you can watch all these meetings on live stream at the city's website. I think that's really important to do if you are interested. And there are also in-camera meetings and those are very strictly regulated by, by law as to what you can put in camera. That's where the public is not allowed. And those are for issues around human resources or real estate um, issues and uh, uh, legal issues. Those are the issues you go in camera for. So next, how do you get involved? This is the fun part. So here's, here's a typical Vancouver City website page. There's a whole lot of information. I went Googling around today some more. And um, 
you can find out what you need to know there. There's another really great way to find out what you need to know, and that's to call 311. That's a system that we set up uh, under Vision, and it is a general number for information about the city. It can be about parking. It can be about the upcoming meetings. It can be about anything involving the city. And if the person who answers it doesn't have it, they have a huge bank of information in front of them. They can get that information for you. And it's actually quite a successful program. You can also um, monitor the city clerk's Twitter account at Van City Clerk, at Van City Clerk. And during meetings, the clerk keeps you updated in terms of what speaker we're on and what issue we're discussing at the time. So what other ways can you get involved? You can go to this page uh, right here, which has all the listed out different ways of doing things. So Talk Vancouver is also a button that's elsewhere on the website. Talk Vancouver is something you can sign up for and then you'll get email alerts and you get um, other ways of being alerted to issues that are happening at the city and inviting your input. So in the past, we might get five or 10 people commenting on a transportation plan. Transpo 2040, we did our first big Talk Vancouver and we had over 10,000 people give pieces of input to Transportation 2040. And that was the first time we really saw a huge number of people telling us what they wanted to say about transportation. It's very exciting. You can also get involved uh, speaking at the park board or at the school board. There's social media and emails. There are all the meetings you can go to, which I encourage, media campaigns. And there's other ways like you can sign up for information. So for instance, I live very close to Broadway. And so I've signed up for the Broadway subway updates. And I get updates several times a week telling me exactly what's happening in terms of road closures and lane changes and what's happening to the bike lane. And all those things are being sent to me because I signed up for that list. So there's a lot of ways to get involved. And then there's one of my favorite pieces of this, which is the advisory committees. We have a bunch of them at City Hall that help advise us on a number of different issues. And all of our panelists here have spoken at City Hall. This is a great place to pass it to them because uh, at least one of them can tell us a great deal about advisory committees. And all three of them have tremendous experience when it comes to coming to City Hall, dealing with the podium, dealing with the crowds, dealing with the weight, and dealing with it online now, which I didn't have to do when I was there. So I'll introduce our three panelists, uh, but before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to say you can ask questions by using the chat function and uh, they'll be pushed to me and I will read them out. Uh, there's also a Q&A button there. And if you're going to use social media to talk about this, add the hashtag, let's act a van. Let's act a van uh, to post about this on your social media channels. So now I'd love to pass it over to our wonderful panelists, three people I'm pleased to be able to call my friends, Aaron Leung, Charles Gauthier, and Theo Lam. So over to you and I'm gonna say, uh, take, a, take the minutes that you need to tell your story and tell us why you're here and why you're enthusiastic about engaging with City Hall. <clears throat> Thanks, Heather. Um, so good to see folks tonight. Um, my name is Aaron Leung. Um, I'm, I, I was the co-chair of, uh, of the City's Children's and Families Advisory Committee. Um, I'm coming to you today from the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt. Um, yeah, so bef before things hit the floor of council, um, things normally come to an advisory committee. Um, during my time on the advisory committee, um, council uh, very much empowered us and, and told staff that essentially anything um, going before council had to go through the relevant advisory committee. So I sat on one for children, youth and families. Um, Tanya Paz, who I know is, a, is an attendee on this call tonight, is actually how we became friends. She was chair of the um, active, um, active Transportation uh, Policy Council. Um, I met many, many friends through, um, through the work of advisory committees. And essentially, we, we as uh, Vancouver residents are empowered to provide feedback to staff on, on council priorities prior to them going to the council floor. Um, so, so that happens in one of two ways. Uh, one is council says in in a in a motion, um, staff you 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 must consult with uh, this advisory committee or advisory committees prior to coming back to us with a uh, with a recommendation, um, or uh, staff can come to us um, in general if the topic applies to us. Um, and it, and for in my case, I basically said what what in general doesn't apply to children, youth, and families, and the answer was almost um, nothing. And so my committee at the time had a special mandate to involve 
uh, people under the age of 12 and uh, all the way up to over the age of 22. Um, so we had committee members from five to 75. Um, and, and really, you know, our, our youngest participants looking to get involved in civic democracy had sometimes the most profound feedback. I know um, we had, a, as an advisory committee, uh, you can make recommendations to council um, and council can choose to take you up on that recommendation or not. Uh, and I was very fortunate on, on one occasion that we had recommended that the city review their, um, their high density family housing guidelines. Uh, to which council at, at the time, Mayor Gregor Robertson had the housing re report amended uh, to have us included. And when staff came back to us, they said to some of our youngest members, well, what, well, what needs to change in your, in your high density homes? And, and our uh, seven-year-old said, um, well, I can't see my friends on the eighth floor because I live on the sixth floor. Um, and all the floors are fobbed off. You need a you need a pass to get onto that floor. And staff took that feedback into consideration when they were reviewing um, when they were reviewing their results. I remember seeing a draft report saying, "Oh, we need more access to common areas so that folks can have access." So, um, speaking at council is one way to get involved. Um, being a part of an advisory committee is another great way. Um, we. We sat, it's a two hour commitment a month as a minimum, but I know that many of us put in many hours getting briefed by staff, participating in consultations. So it's sort of a choose your own adventure. Um, but I also had the, the pleasure of speaking to things on the floor council. And um, I know more others will have more to say about that. So I highly encourage folks, if you have questions about advisory committees or how things get, get to the council floor, uh, advisory committees are a great way to get involved, whether you're in a, you want to do something in a super narrow scope like the Food Policy Council um, or advising on heritage or something more broad like the Seniors Advisory Committee uh, or Mike, the committee that I was on. So yeah, Heather, with that, I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. And uh, Aaron was a tremendous advocate for his committee. I'm going to pass it now to Charles. And Charles, uh, I cannot tell you how many hours I spent staring back at Charles across the crowded room. Um, and um, and when we were talking about this session, Charles, you mentioned that the council meeting is often the last step in the advocacy process. I thought that was fascinating. I'll pass it to you now to, to give us some words of wisdom and experience. Thanks, Heather. And uh, I'm happy to be here today to share and learn from others that are on the panel. Uh, I wanna start off by saying that, you know, in my case, I represented uh, a business organization of 8,000 members. So what I'm gonna say, you know, I want you to take that with a grain of salt and also understand that it might, it certainly would operate differently if you were speaking as a, a sole individual in front of council. But uh, let me go through my experience uh, over the course of the last 29 years with the downtown BIA. <clears throat> so yes, speaking to council was the last step um, or speaking to council was the last step in advocacy. And I always felt that it was important to establish relationships uh, with um, newly elected councillors or councillors that were coming back and also important to develop those same kind of relationships with uh, the city manager, the deputy city manager and uh, senior city staff. And uh, when I would do that, I would do it with the sense that I wasn't always going there advocating on behalf of the organization, but I was really keenly interested in knowing what they needed from us as a business organization. Like how can we help with some of the projects that they were uh, moving forward to council or if councilors were advocating for certain things. And once that uh, relationship was built, I felt that the rest of it was going to be much easier in terms of uh, advocating on behalf of the organization. On the other side, I, I had an organization where I had to ensure that I had uh, the support of the board and uh, we had a policy advisory council in place comprised of our members. And so I wasn't just speaking on behalf of Charles Gossier, I was speaking on behalf of the DVBIA so it was really critical that I understood where the board uh, stood on a variety of different issues. And we had a policy advisory council that advised the board, very similar to the advisory council that Aaron just spoke about, uh, but um, obviously operating with different rules and regulations in place. Uh, so once I had that side of the equation established in terms of what the policy positions were going to be of the organization, that it made my job a lot easier. And then going to the next steps of advocacy, uh, letter writing, uh, sending emails to counselors, 
uh, using social media, you know, to advocate and get across, you know, what our position was going to be on certain issues was extremely critical um, in being successful. And by the time I stood up in front of uh, council and council chambers, um, they had already heard the message. And uh, you typically only have five minutes to address council. And you have to be, you know, very focused on what you're going to say. That Those five minutes go by extremely quickly. And those of you that have been there or watched it on television, there's a light system. Uh, once you get to that amber light and that red light is just around the corner, you have to be careful that you're not going to run out of time. And uh, I usually would focus on uh, just a few salient points. Uh, some of them would actually help to tease questions that the counselors would ask me because they would want to have more information on a particular issue that I brought forward. And hence that would then lead to, you know, my, my having a lot more time at the podium than I would like, but certainly to get across the points that I was representing uh, for the organization. And then just very quickly, uh, you know, even though I have spoken to council a lot of times, I was always uh, going forward with uh, a little bit of butterflies in my stomach. Um, you know, you're standing up at that podium and yes, there are 11 people in front of you and then the support staff, but behind you, uh, pre-COVID times, you would have a gallery of people and sometimes they weren't necessarily agreeing with what I was saying. And uh, it, it can be intimidating. And I, I do recall one particular instance where I did lose my cool uh, and I did turn around and I did ask the hecklers, uh, you know, please, uh, you had your time to speak at council. Uh, let me have my five minutes and uh, then you and I can debate this afterwards. And that seemed to have helped a little bit. And then I also asked the chair uh, if they could get control of the room. <laughs> and so I did that as well. So, um, you know, it can be intimidating, but I think if you're, um, you know, firming your beliefs and uh, you're there to speak on behalf of an organization or as an individual, uh, you have that right to do so. And uh, I think it's a great part of our democracy that we can do that at the local level. You can't do that at the provincial level or at the federal level. You have to be asked to come and speak or address a particular um, a body that's been in place to listen to opinions, or you can write your opinions to those to those bodies. But you know, this is um, you know the purest form of democracy that you can get involved with, and um, it's exhilarating, it's exciting, it can create some fear, butterflies in your stomach. But it's uh, it's extremely rewarding, and uh, I know I've always enjoyed doing it and speaking to council and uh, being able to influence an outcome. Thanks, Cheryl. And and uh, with ten councilors and the mayor each having uh, five or three minutes to ask questions, depending on the type of meeting, Charles will be at the microphone for a good hour sometimes. If he had a really juicy topic we were talking about, so I appreciate your patience and your dedication. Uh, we're now going to go to Theo, who has a great experience with NGOs and small business and active in her community, as well as being a parent and living right here in the city. So, Theo, tell us about your experiences at City Hall. Um, thanks, Heather and Charles and Aaron. And hello, everybody. Um, I, I've, I've got, I don't know if 30 years, but but three now um, speaking to council. And um, what really comes to mind for me um, are sort of three salient um, points. The first being, and this is this is really for folks who maybe haven't spoken to council before. Um, if you're going in for your first time, or if you're thinking about it, or if there's an issue coming up, um, as Charles said, all the feelings of nerves, butterflies, that's pretty normal. Um, whether it's online or in council chambers, because of course we went online throughout COVID. I think that the, the most important thing you can do right off the bat is to commit to showing the councillors who you are. So, and what I mean by that is when you're thinking about your position, what you want to say with your five minutes, if you don't necessarily have the capacity or the organizational power to do all of that pre-advocacy that organizations like the Strathcona BIA or the DVBIA have to do, um, it's likely that that five minutes is going to be critical to how you get your point across and how memorable you are. So if you're nervous, show them that. And, and I, the reason I say this is the first time I spoke to council in a really significant way, um, I didn't know, no one had told me it could be a marathon. And this was with our current council. I went 
you know, ahead of one agenda item from the item that I wanted to speak to late in the afternoon. And it just so happened the item before mine kind of exploded. It just exploded. It was fascinating to watch. The problem is it exploded and I had my three and a half year old son with me. And so we were sitting in council chambers. I'm like Netflixing the heck out of my phone, trying to keep him engaged as I'm watching sort of democracy unfold. Four hours later, he sat with me the whole time. I finally get up there. And just as I'm beginning to speak, what does he announce to the entire chambers? Mommy, I have to go pee. And what he does is he runs out of council chambers through the moving glass doors. And you know who follows him to her absolute credit is Councillor Chris Boyle, goes running out after him. She's a mama, she knows, and takes care of Operation Bathroom while I speak to you know a zoning application or development application um, that was important to my constituency in Strathcombe BIA. So um, I'll tell you, it was embarrassing um, as all heck but it cemented um, my words in their brains. And it was a very good outcome, not because of that experience necessarily, but um, it humanized the, uh, the back and forth. I think another um, point to really um, take in is don't be afraid to show counsel once you show them who you are, how you feel about the issue. I think emotion can be really important. There was a time when I um, was pretty outraged. So, at a decision that was uh, coming down in council. It had to do with an allocation, a series of grants, um, and uh, that wasn't going to go on to support a very important project working with Chinese benevolent societies and um, emerging entrepreneurs in Chinatown and Strathcona. This incredible project had been very exciting for council and staff for a year, but in order for it to flourish, like so many grassroots initiatives, it needs resources, it needs advocacy, it needs power. And the CIA decided, decided, you know, we can't continue um, with this line of support. So I had chosen, taken the opportunity when they were announcing these grant allocations, not to advocate or argue that the money shouldn't go to any of the other organizations that were receiving it, that was really important, but to really ask council to question the kinds of initiatives they wanna support and the kinds of change they wanna see in Strathcona and Chinatown if they can't support a project like this. Well, that erupted this whole conversation, both in council and then offline through emails and phone calls both with staff and council alike. And I did give staff the heads up that I was going to be coming forward and being critical of this decision that they had made. I had a very good relationship to Charles's point. There was a lot of development that had gone into that. Well, what it led to is uh, a lot of back and forth and discussion. And six months later, a special project in motion was brought forward to specifically fund support and direct power to this particular project because it had, been, it, it, it had, had that, um, that time on their radar in council, in public, and had had that attention brought to it. So you can really use this time if you're willing to show how you feel, who you are. And, um, and just like an, a final point, again, we don't all have organizational power behind us, but if you can bring um, data and evidence to support your position, it can be deeply powerful. I've pulled from 2016 census data before, I've used BizMap online from the city's own statistics, I, at the time in Strathcona, my constituency, we were collecting data. Whatever I can do to make my case, this is the art and craft of persuasion. And counselors, and I'm sure Heather, you can speak to this, like you're expert in so many things, but you also have to move through so much. So often the issues in front of you, you're, you know, it's, it's difficult to do a deep dive. So you as the speaker, if you can bring that expertise, that data and that evidence forward, make that case within five minutes, it really strengthens your position. And just do what you can. If you don't have the organizational power behind you, spend an evening pulling what you can together, testimonials, letters, census data, whatever you can find. That's brilliant. That's really brilliant. And actually one of our first questions was almost exactly that same question. What, what, what do you bring to the table? Um, uh, I'd like us to have a bit of a conversation about this now. We've got a couple of questions coming in. So I'll, I'll start the question, the uh, conversation with uh, a question that I'll pose to all three of you to answer as you choose, which is what happens when the counselors ask you a question you don't know the answer to? Now, first of all, you know that you are not obliged to answer a question from counsel when you're standing at the podium on the hot spot, and you will get questions. If you've got a touchy subject, you will get potentially some touchy questions. So what do you do if you don't know the answer to it or, or if, you, um, if you need to be very diplomatic in the way that you answer it? Charles, I thought you might have something to say about this. 
Yeah, and I have used that quite a bit saying I don't know the answer, but I sometimes use it as an opportunity to bridge uh, to comment on something that I might have missed in my presentation, as long as it's relatively close to the question. Um, and so I guess counselors, again, are limited in the amount of time they can ask questions. So uh, you don't necessarily want to burn their time or waste their time. Um, but I'll just acknowledge I don't have the answer to that. But if you allow me, I'd like to just elaborate on something that's kind of relevant to what you've asked. Perfect. Yeah, there it is. Pivot and bridge, says Theo. Um, another question came in saying, how do you get on an advisory committee? Aaron, do you want to talk about the process you went through? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll post the link in the, in the chat, but um, council essentially, every, so you, you, you sit for a two-year mandate. So generally uh, there, are, there are two calls for application. There are two big calls for applications, one just after the municipal election. And then one about in the mid, what I would call the midterms. Um, and you fill out an application form uh, through the city's website. Uh, the clerk's office will put together by uh, literal, by, I've seen the binders, literal binders. And there's a subcommittee of council. Yeah, <laughs> Heather knows. There's a subcommittee <laughs> of council that, that deals with the appointments. And they have a new uh, equity mandate um, started in, in this term. Um, for how they screen and, and appoint and select and their uh, term limits. Um, but essentially you, you state your intentions about why you wanna serve, uh, whether it's through your lived experience or through your education or your interests. And uh, council then assembles a, in my case, it was a 22 person panel um, for that committee and, and the committees will, will vary in size. And then you serve for those two years. and. Uh, when there are periodic vacancies, uh, they will post those as well. So there might be a, a, a term that they'll fill if someone, you know, has to drop out. Uh, they will post and they will fill for that remaining time until the next sort of big round. That's really useful. And something that's not widely advertised or known is you can actually observe most of those committee meetings. Uh, the Food Policy Council always had a, a significant um, peanut gallery of people who were just super keeners about food. And I suggest for anything you want to get involved with, go and watch it. Like if you're going to speak to council, go and watch it first. I think that's brilliant. And thanks yeah. for the link there, Aaron. I think um, uh, like, I had a, yeah. a university class stop by once and it was super jarring because we were not the ones who would get the peanut gallery. And then we had like a peanut <laughs> gallery of like 20 people all like who wanted to know what we were up to. And yeah, it was, uh, it, I think, don't think the agenda was too interesting that evening, but. Uh... <laughs> well, apparently it was. Um, I've got a question here about how do you sign up to speak to councils? Can you speak to the park board and school board? The answer is yes for the park board. Aaron, I think you can nod yes to the school board. Yeah. Uh, and they have their own websites, but you can get to them through the city's website as well. Oh, here's a little tip for na um, navigating the city's website. Sometimes it's hard to find things from within the website. So I just go to Google and say city of Vancouver, blah, blah, blah. And that will get me there faster than going to the city of Vancouver site and putting it in the search bar. Um, but does one of you want to talk about signing up to speak to council, what the process is. Nobody wants to, you know, I, you, I, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's not overly complex. It's also not intuitive. Um, yeah. You, and as are all um, processes in the city, I see Charles, you have your hand up. I'm sure you'll add to this, um, but you, you go like, ta like, you know, tactically you go online and you register and then you're told that your application is received and you will receive a speaking number. Um, and here's the tricky part. You need to know what the agendas are coming up, which means in your Google calendar, you are diarizing when those agendas go live and then when the speakers list goes live for sign up, because it can be really critical if you're in like the first five or 10 speakers. If you're speaking to an issue, which I kid you not, like BIAs, you know, food security, whatever you're talking about, if you're like speaker 237, it's not always necessarily gonna have the same impact that speaker number three has, but that doesn't mean you can't have impact. I wanna stress that if you, if you follow sort of everything that we're speaking to and you're passionate about this and you can make a persuasive case, but the order of the speakers does have power. And I'm sure Charles has more to say about that. Charles. 
I was going to riff a little bit on that. I, I think uh, Theo read my mind. I, I, over time, I was not rushing to be the first speaker um, because um, I knew that I would get <laughs> drilled with a bunch of questions uh, right off the get go. Um, and so I would try to get into what I would call the, the, the 10th or the 11th or the 12th spot. And I was really comfortable with that. Um, so I, I, I learned over the years not to be rushing there and being the first one to speak um, or not even within the first five, uh, because I also wanted to see if there were other organizations or individuals that were gonna line up to speak. And I wanted to get a bit of an idea if I didn't have a relationship with them as to where they might land on a particular topic. Um, now, if it was something near and dear to our heart, like you know BIA renewal, of course I'd be signing up right away <laughs> or something that I knew would be relatively quick in terms of being able to speak to council. Um, but those are my strategies that it took me a few years to understand, uh, and not necessarily be the first in line, uh, and have a whole host of questions and be up there for an hour. At least Aaron. Thanks Heather. And just riffing off of that, you know, speaker order, I think matters a lot. And I've seen, I've had friends who have spoke at council, uh, the, the one perk of being on advisory committee, other than having, um, very large access to staff and staff often have quite a bit of time to, to come to us before things hit the, the council floor is that advisory committees actually get priority access in the queue. Um, so oftentimes you you are the first one, um, which is not which is both a blessing because you have some time certainty and also terrifying um, because if you don't necessarily want to be going first, um, you you are sort of up first so, so they queue folks up. Um, which was helpful in terms of time. I, I remember that there were many occasions where council would have a packed agenda and things might move around, but at least I knew when generally I would have to, to be on the floor. And so um, just for folks to know, if, if you are looking for that priority access, that, that is, a, um, that, that, that is a, a ticket in, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good uh, push to get on an advisory committee. I want to make a comment too from being on the other side of the podium there is that, um, well, first of all, I went to the website today and there's a video about speaking to council. It's brilliant. It actually shows the three buttons and the lights and the timer and gives you a heads up that those might, that the podium might move while you're staying there because the clerk can make it higher or lower. That kind of freaks people out the first time. Um, I also wanna make a brief comment on the order of speaking. There are people who rush to be the last speaker because they want the last word and we can see them. I don't think they, they, they those are glass doors. We can see them running in and out of the door. Like they literally go and hide in the hallway when the clerk calls their name and then run back in when they think it's the last speaker. It's, it's, it's kind of hilarious. It's a little bit like um, vaudeville, but, um, but uh, people, have, people have their ways of doing things. Um, and there was an earlier comment about what makes an effective speech. And you, know, you, you, you said it brilliantly. I would also say that no matter how angry you are, don't personally insult the counselors or the staff. Um, the, the chair should stop you if you do that. And um, I actually said to one of our, our frequent flyers one time, I said, Mr. So-and-so, does that approach often get you the results you are seeking? That's, it just isn't going to help. Um, so do your research. So I've got a couple other questions that have popped up here. Um, just wondering whether or not people who are on the, the talk follow Twitter. Like that's how I actually get most of my information about council now, because I've got a full-time job and five other volunteer jobs. And so I don't sit and watch the meetings, but I know what's on the agenda usually. And Twitter tells me how it's going. And if it's exciting, I might uh, tune in. But but uh, are people watching, do you have favorite people that you watch on Twitter that give you the information you want? I watch active transportation very closely. And so I'm always uh, hearing what the cyclists have to say about everything, a lot of things about everything. Um, but it's really useful for me. But Maybe throw it in the chat room with uh, some of your favorite Twitter accounts to follow if you're, if you're a City Hall junkie. Let's see. That is, the, apparently there was a question that was thrown just into the chat. Just one thing on that, Heather. Sorry. Yeah. Like, just yeah, yeah. For folks, like, Twitter is great for folks who are on Twitter, but there's, there's a very clear, there's a lot of body of research to back this up. Like, there's generational divides yeah, on yeah, who's yeah. on Twitter. So, it did, like, and Aaron probably, Thinks about this all the time, like how are you reaching youth, right? The, it, it, and you're just Twitter's not going to be the channel for that. So you're going yeah. to be hearing a certain audience talking about city issues on Twitter. But I hope it's not the only space you're looking. Yeah. 
No, it's a really good point. You tend to get the policy geeks uh, on Twitter, Charles. And don't yeah, worry about I, raising hands. Go ahead and unmute yourselves and just check. Yeah, and the ones that I typically follow are followed, uh, and I still do, but Dan Fumano, uh, Francis Bula, yeah. uh, Brent Totterin, um, there's others, you know, that are anyone with a huge following and with street cred and with, you know, the 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 educational background, so to speak, you know, like Brent Totterin's a planner, so I would follow him. And uh, I would often pick up the phone too with those individuals and just ask them, you know, what, what is your thought on this particular policy issue or matter that's going to council? And uh, they willingly give their time as well. So uh, those are just a few name, names that I wanted to drop. Those are great ones. I appreciate that. I think, and just to like, I think they definitely willingly give their time to BIAD, Charles, but not like I, I keep coming back to this, not everyone has institutional power. So if you're someone who can't necessarily call Dan Fumono up on a cell phone, uh, which the first time you do that is also terrifying, um, uh, then definitely looking to other sources outside of Twitter and who, who are the people online who are speaking to the issues you want, bring in their testimonials and, and look to them as well. I think the principles that Charles is laying down are critical, right? Reach out to the people who are experts in the issue you want to speak to. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I have me, it was, oh, um, oh, sorry. If for me, it was uh, also really handy to keep track of where council was at, particularly if it was a complicated day. Um, but also there are a lot of people who, I, I mean, for me, it was school board. That was sort of my passion. So I sort of kept tabs on that. Um, but, you know, for, for folks, it's a way to keep your finger on, on the pulse. Uh, but also just want to acknowledge that Twitter can be a very helpful tool and also sometimes uh, the, the not so great bad place. Um, and and to to turn it off every once in a while if it's devolving and um, and there are things that you could do there. But but overall, I found uh, Twitter to be quite quite a helpful tool for keeping track of where council is at. You know, the one thing I, I want to chip add as well is that read the report. Like if there's a report going to council, no one said this yet, but read the report. I mean, it's chock full of great information uh, that city staff have resourced and uh, are presenting to council. Yes, they are lengthy to read on many occasions, but you know, I think you have, to, I would highly recommend be familiar with the topic that you're going to be speaking to council on. And uh, you know, it, take the time to do your research, take the time to read the report, and obviously take the time to put together your, your presentation. I know councilor, former councilor deal, Heather, you know, you would typically tell people not to use a script uh, and uh, I usually stuck to my script, um, but I think I did better when I was being questioned and I didn't have anything, a piece of paper to rely on. So do what's comfortable for you. Absolutely, and be comfortable. I mean, we've had people faint up there and we don't want to see people fainting at the podium. It's, 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 uh, even when we had an MD as our city manager, it was no fun. I understand a poll has been put up and I want to make a brief comment about being way down the list. I don't, I can't speak to this council, but Andrea and I would sit next to each other and we had the speakers list printed out for us. And we would actually make a note next to every single speaker and Andrea color coded hers, like different, different highlighters, colors for in favor, opposed, uh, concerned about traffic, worried about their children. Like she had a whole, and, and when one of us would step out for a few minutes to go to the washroom or whatever we needed to do and come back in, we'd say, you know, we'd fill in the spots on each other's sheets of paper there. So. We do pay attention um, all the way through. So apparently there's a poll question that's been put up. Um, what are the issues that people on this call follow at City Hall? So here's some big ones and it, and it doesn't have to be Twitter. We've had a good conversation both here personally and in the chat about the pros and cons of Twitter. But um, there's, some, there's some answers coming up. Yeah, Tanya makes a good point about speaking for five minutes. Five minutes is great if you've got five minutes of new material. But if you're further down the list, um, repeating what other people have said uh, is not necessarily the best use of your time. Telling your story, and you know, you you, you described that, Charles, Aaron, all three of you described that. Tell your story um, and why it matters to you. That that really that that resonates. And if you have facts and figures to back it up, I'm a scientist. I love facts and figures. Heather, can so I let's, chime in on yes. the report? Um, the, the reports that Charles brought up. I think that's a, a great thing. And there's also some shortcuts uh, for the report. So, um, you know, uh, the, the report comes to council. There's normally a summary. Read the summary. It's on the first page. 
Um, there are a, a very, sometimes a short, most of the time a lengthy list of recommendations, and that's what council is considering adopting. So that's sort of your Coles notes for what's in the report or what's going to be done if the report is enacted. Uh, and then there's a conclusion section somewhere. And if you're looking for the, the, the messy details uh, or the, or personally, the interesting details for me, but sometimes too much information, um, if, you're, if you're not looking for specifics, the middle of the report is the analysis. So you can really get into it. Um, but you can really read a council report, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes if you sort of go front cover, back cover, uh, yeah. and then go from there. And a lot of it's a lot of it's boilerplate. So you learn how to brush past this, the, legal, the legal words, et cetera, and get to the really juicy stuff. That's a really good point. The director um, of real estate services. Okay, skipping. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't tell them you said that. Um, there it is. Eighty percent rental housing policy, twenty percent budget, fifty-three percent rezonings, and forty percent other. And I just gotta say, I wish people paid more attention to the budget because that's what pays for all the other things. The, um, you know, we took on housing when it's supposed to be a provincial jurisdiction and we, we we dug in and said we needed to do at least shelters and that was done through a budget process and it was done using property taxes so it's an important thing i we tried for years to find ways to make it more fun but it's still a challenge um yes theo i agree we could do nothing but budget and how to read a budget and analyze it and re respond to it so we're getting close to the end of the evening um, would our three panelists, do you have something you'd like to say, something you didn't say earlier or a nugget or just a, a, a good joke or, you know, want to comment on the weather, for instance? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with like a last moment and then turn it over to Charles and Aaron. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking time on a Monday, Monday, Monday evening. Um, you know, I just, the last thing I'll say is like, at the end of the day, your five minutes in front of council are yours. You spend them any way you want and you're entitled to every second of them as far as I'm concerned. Council was elected to that role. They know what they signed up for and staff know what they signed up for as well, which is to support democracy, city building and community building. Um, I'm really fierce about this. I mean, we can support all kinds of structure, but at the end of the day, that's your time uh, because we are citizens in the same city and that's how city building happens. So. Good luck if you're doing it for the first time, it's exhilarating. Thank you. Aaron. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, make allies and, and use your privilege. I know that that was something that um, we always try to do as advisory committees was, you know, I was not the expert on seniors or people with disabilities, but we'd often, if, if we agreed and quite often we agreed, we piggyback on the recommendations of, other advisory committees or other community members. And so I, I'd say, you know, you'll you'll get to see a lot or hopefully when we're back to it, something that resembles something more in person, you'll see lots of familiar faces. I remember sitting at council chambers and when you're waiting for your term, but you're seeing other people go up on other items, you know, seeing people, seeing Charles or seeing Theo and, you know, honestly not not really having the 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 gumption to say hello, but you know, build those allies and, and you know find find your friends and amplify. Um, your voices because you know it, it's a privilege to speak to council it's a privilege to sit on an advisory committee and the more people you can talk to and build relationships with the better your experience will be thank you for that charles yeah, kind of building on what aaron just said uh, some of my best work was done while waiting to speak at council um, you know with um, talking to other organization reps, speaking to citizens, uh, speaking to city staff that were actually waiting for their turn to address council. Sometimes councillors came out uh, into the outside of the chambers to uh, just talk to the people there. Um, so I did some of my best work there and was able to get a lot done. So yes, I did spend a lot of time in the corridors of city hall, um, but I felt that it was really productive and um, you know building better understanding, building bridges, you know, I always was interested, even though I didn't agree with people on their perspectives, I always took the time to listen to what they had to say. And I, I never, you know, really stood firm on issues. I always felt that I was able to budge a little bit on some things because I understood and someone took the time to share that with me. So uh, I can't wait for council to resume in person again and for people to go back because during COVID, I felt it, I felt really isolated, you know, waiting to be on that call to get to save my five minutes, but not having any of those visual 
uh, cues that you can pick up from people. And uh, it was really uncomfortable for me. Uh, I, I certainly felt that uh, it worked against me to a large extent. So um, unfortunately, I won't have that opportunity unless I go there as a private citizen, which I may do. I'm sure there'll be an issue that will spark my interest and I'll use my skills from the past to speak on something I'm passionate about. So thanks again to Vision. This has been a great um, session and opportunity to share my experience with you and learn from others. Thanks, Charles. And uh, for my own part, um, I can tell you that sitting on the other side of the desk or when I was chairing committees, the podium, which is it's quite a it's quite a Star Trek sort of a, a array of screens you have in front of you up there that I never forgot what a privilege it was to be sitting there listening to someone who spent so much time, sometimes a lot of energy, sometimes an enormous amount of stress and anxiety, uh, hours and hours of waiting with children crying and needing to pee, and, um, and that they took that time to come and speak to us, you know, even if I didn't agree with them, maybe especially if I didn't agree with them, the, that they knew that they were speaking to a council that might not agree with their position, but um, it was an honor to serve, and uh, I miss it, but uh, it's okay to not be there right now, but uh, but what I really miss was these interactions. I loved sitting there and having the back and forth and interactions with people in the chamber and watching how democracy worked, the chess game, the little conversations that are going through. You kind of see it from where you're sitting. You see out the window, you see out the doorway, you see the people waiting to speak, you see the staff speaking with each other. And it was an honor to do that. And with people like the three panelists here tonight, um, they really up the game for all of us, for the city as a whole. So thank you for being here and presenting. I know uh, we may have a budget 101 coming up, but I'm gonna pass it back to Mira to talk about next steps and close us out for the night. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much and I'll be really quick. I mostly just wanna thank Heather and Theo and Charles and Aaron for um, joining and leading us through this conversation. I also wanna acknowledge that um, Alan Wong, Vision Vancouver School Board Trustee took the time to be with us tonight. So Alan, thanks so much. It's great to virtually see you. Um, I hope many of you take the cues and, and um, tips from our participants and, and panelists tonight and, um, and take the time to speak out. I strongly agree with what Theo said. This is your city. It's no one else's. Um, it's all of ours. And if you want to have an impact, get your voice out there, um, go and use it. Um, because if you don't, someone else will, and they may not share your opinion. Um, and the same goes for political parties. You want to be engaged. You want to have an impact. There's a vehicle to do it, and um, and we're here to do that with you. Um, I also just wanted to follow up on um, the point about the budget. We've um, considered doing a budget 101 event, so if that's of interest to you to actually know, like, how does a budget get created, and what, what's the timeline and when could you participate or speak out or engage in it? Um, you know, throw, a, throw your name in the chat or, um, or send us an email and let us know if you're interested in that. Um, it, it's formative and foundational to um, city policy. 2022, of course, is a big year. Um, there'll be an election coming up and Vision Vancouver is actively recruiting candidates to run for council, school board and park board. And we'd love to um, see many of you do that. I know some of you are considering doing that and um, I certainly hope you, um, you take the leap. Um, and of course, for those of you who want to see more events like this um, and others, we welcome um, contributions and donations um, at, um, on our website. Maybe someone can pop the, um, the, the URL into the chat. Um, we've got our AGM coming up November 28th, and we're also excited to be hosting an in-person fundraiser on December 5th. So if you're missing chatting in the corridors, um, come to the fundraiser and, um, and, and chat over a drink or some food there. Please join our email list and keep an eye out on our website. And just thank you again so much to our panelists and to um, Heather Deal as the moderator tonight. And of course, to all of you for joining. I hope to see you all soon.